Boeing 747, the world's first wide-bodied jet. So wide, the Wright brothers' historic flight was shorter than its wingspan. The quantum leap in technology of that airplane was just extraordinary. And it was much more than just a big aircraft. This airplane allowed every person on Earth the opportunity to get an airplane and fly anywhere else. But there's a hidden story to the jumbo. It was a fight all the way. It was a billion dollar gamble that stretched technology to the limits. The whole engine would move and the structure was obviously shaken and you'd hear a very loud bang. Pushing the Boeing company close to financial meltdown. Boeing gambled the company millions of dollars on this project. But when it did fly, it soared off into the history books. The vision of that airplane, as big as it was, lifting off for the first time, was just magic. It became an icon, the most recognized aircraft in the world. When a 747 pulls up to the gate, people take pictures of it. Little kids point at it. The Jumbo has transported the equivalent of 80% of the human race. The 747 uh, rated on a, a 1 to 10 scale it has to be a 10. It's solid state, if you will. You know, you, it's majestic. The plane that created a revolution and changed the world. This is the latest generation jumbo, the 747-8. One of the world's largest and most advanced jet airliners. Its massive engines can take it close to the speed of sound. Go. The 747 rapidly accelerates to the speed of a Formula One racing car. Rotates. Effortlessly lifting over 400 tons into the night sky. But the story of how this iconic aircraft became such a success was far from trouble free. The 747 story started on a quiet fishing trip in Alaska with two giants of the aviation world. One trip, the powerful yet suave owner of Pan Am told Bill Allen, the no-frills boss of Boeing, of his vision for a superplane. Trip wanted an aircraft two and a half times larger than anything that had gone before. This was the early days of commercial jet travel. One trip at Pan American Airways saw an opportunity here for a bigger airplane to take advantage of this growth. An airplane with 400 seats that could carry more people and make more revenue. Both men were reaching retirement and they wanted to go out with a bang. This is the big one. Gentlemen. Trip signed for 25 of the Superjets, to be called the 747. It was the largest commercial aircraft order in history. A deal worth a staggering $3.7 billion in today's money. And Bill Allen agreed Trip could have them in just 28 months. It set an almost impossible challenge for Boeing's engineers. This was all new technology. Remember, this, this airplane was going to be twice the size of, of any commercial airplane in existence. And the time constraints, the schedule that they put on themselves was incredibly tight. Nobody had any idea of what it should look like. So the first stage was to draw preliminary designs. Heading the new 747 division was a young engineer, Joe Sutter. It was his first big break. They gave me 20 people to do preliminary studies. 
and we were on our own and all we knew it was bigger. They wanted the airplane to have good range and they wanted the airplane to go as fast as it could. Joe Sutter, now in his 90s, has returned to the original 747 prototype. Back then as a junior engineer, he sometimes faced a hostile reception from those more senior. I had to do a little bit of education that I was the boss. And I'd kiddingly tell them if, uh, if they didn't want to go along with my orders, I had a good assignment in Bangladesh I could send them to. From the start, Sutter's team worked around the clock. But despite the size of their challenge, they were not Boeing's number one priority. Most of the company's resources and best talent were being diverted into another aircraft. We were certainly not the only kids on the block as far as the 747 program was concerned. The real hot button item around Seattle was the supersonic transport airplane. This is what Boeing believed was the future. A supersonic transporter to travel three times the speed of sound. It was designed to outfly its European supersonic rival, Concorde, also in its design phase. And when Boeing's SST came into service, the 747 was to be relegated to shipping freight. Now, the SST was the future of flight. Nobody was going to want to fly on a subsonic plane when you can get on a supersonic transport and fly two and a half times the speed of sound and get to your destination in a fraction of the time and the 747 was just almost an afterthought. They didn't expect to build more than 50 of these airplanes, and they expected mostly to be transports, but it'd be sort of like a stopgap until they got this airplane running. So obviously, the 747 was playing second fiddle the whole time. Sutter's team was shoved into old premises and starved of resources. The engineers who were working the supersonic transports felt, I think, that they were um, a little bit superior to some of the other folks around the place. Everybody now thinks that the 747 was uh, the queen of the skies and everything was very in, in good shape. Well, that wasn't the case at all. There was a fight all of the uh, way. The 747 is the most distinctive airliner in the skies. Most of us, when we fly, we don't know what airplane we're on. A lot of people don't, don't know what, what type of a plane they're flying. But when you fly a 747, you know you're flying a 747 because of that distinctive hum. But the shape might have ended up very different from the one we know today. Pan Am Boss One Trip demanded an ocean liner of a design with two narrow decks, one on top of the other. The well, first idea that came about was taking a conventional 707-sized airplane and taking two of those single-aisle fuselages and putting them together. And that's the airplane you see here. And from what I know from Joe is that they didn't like this idea very well. One trip, you know, he was sort of a Navy man. He, he wanted an airplane with round windows like portholes. Sutter's gut feeling was it looked like a turkey. We sat and looked at the requirements for an airplane like that and decided there's so many problems with the double-decker, there's got to be a different solution. Sutter worried that in an emergency, passengers would not jump off a top deck 25 feet above the ground. Then his team had a eureka moment. And uh, my people came up with the idea, well, why not go to a wide single-deck airplane? Rather than put two decks on top of each other, Sutter's team put them side by side. And what would be the world's first wide-bodied aircraft was created. But there was a problem for the freighter version. Opening the nose was the best solution for loading. But where to put the cockpit? Then, in a stroke of genius, Sutter decided it should go on top. And so the distinctive hump was born. To think outside the box of something larger took several leaps of faith. Today it seems commonplace, but you know, 40 years ago it was not. We had a hell of a time 
convincing our own management first that that was the way to go. Boeing management agonized that Tripp, who was paying, would go ballistic if he didn't get his double-decker. They decided to tell him the bad news, but banned Sutter from going. We had this presentation in New York. I didn't go to it because my management felt I'd pushed too hard and would maybe get one trip upset, so I sent a fellow named Milt Heineman, who did our interior design, who was a lot more amiable guy than me. Heineman set off to the Pan Am offices, armed with a secret weapon in his briefcase. He had to convince Tripp that his passengers wouldn't be squashed in a single deck. He had just one shot, and it was time for his secret weapon. Can you help me, please? Heinemann showed with a 20-foot clothesline just how wide the 747 would be. It was a startling piece of theater. No one had imagined such a cathedral of the air, almost double the width of any airliner built before. It didn't convince one trip right away, but his people were astounded. And all of a sudden, this opened up the, the, all these possibilities. It was, it was a moment of, of discovery. Tripp eventually bought the idea when he saw a mock-up of what his plane would look like. Sutter got the go-ahead for the first wide-body jet in history. But now they had to turn a wooden mock-up into a real flying machine. The race was on. In wind tunnels, they evaluated the aircraft. Only the first flight would tell if it would really fly. But these tests were critical. Get the design wrong now, and the consequences could be disastrous. The airplane business is completely different than any other business. You're committing $10 billion to just throw it in. You're stuck with it. So you better do it right or forget it. 75,000 drawings detailed how every last part fitted into the prototype. I think one of the first impressions one had of the real size of the airplane was when we first put a drawing, a cross-sectional drawing of the engine up on the office wall and really realized the office wall wasn't quite big enough. Inside, the 747 program becomes a reality. Soon, Sutter and his team were running out of space. Boeing had to take drastic action. Today, at Boeing's massive Everett plant in Washington State, 747s are still rolling off the production line. This is the largest building on Earth, equivalent in area to over 50 football fields. So high, clouds can form in the ceiling. It was built specially for the 747. At huge expense, Boeing flattened the wilderness north of Seattle. They even built a railroad to bring materials to the site. This was one of the largest construction sites in the world. In just six months, Sutter was able to start moving in. Soon, it wasn't only the Everett plant that was entering the record books. The prototype was made up of 4.5 million parts, 100 miles of wiring, and nearly 75 tons of aluminium. But it wasn't just the parts that were mounting up. The amount of money that was being spent on all aspects of this program uh, was pretty astronomical. Boeing faced even more expense when new orders from 25 airlines meant production models had to be started. The 747 was now costing over 20 million pounds a day. But there was no real money coming in. The airlines only pay on delivery. Boeing faced a cash crisis. The banks threatened to pull out. Boeing gambled the company millions of dollars on this project. They took a big risk on it. To help deal with the crisis, Sutter was summoned to a high-level meeting. My boss, who was one of these people that decided, well, you can do anything by...